Sound check one to Zoom, one to Zoom. Sound check two, sound check two to Zoom. Thank you, Jenny.
Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Gainesville Tuesday meeting back in the Cade Museum. We're happy that you're all here today. Please remember to silence your cell phone at this time. And if you're joining us via YouTube or watching per on YouTube, please register your participation by sending an email to info at rotarygainesville.org. Today we're going to change up the agenda just a little bit, so we're going to kick it off today with our Pledge of Allegiance. If you would join me in pledging to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now Lori Vidal with our invocation. Good afternoon. Let us, let us pray together. From the psalmist of old, we have these words of encouragement and care. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person who takes refuge in him. How encouraging words of comfort and care can be to those in need physically with conditions that might not be improving. And how blessed are those who can step in and seek to improve quality of life for those with special needs. Help us together to build goodwill and better friendships so that in these times of continuous pressing needs, we might be able to give some comfort to those in need. I pray in the name of the God of comfort. Amen. Thank you, Lori. You may be seated, but if you're a guest or visiting Rotarian, please remain standing. We'll bring a microphone around for introduction. Hello again, Rotarians. You all know me as Colleen Keene. My guest today knows me as Nana. Please help me welcome my grandson, Tanner Jeffcoat. Hi, Rotarians. I'm Karen Sandlin. And these are my two granddaughters, Taya Munson and Talia Munson. Please welcome them. I think that's all. Thank you and welcome everyone. And now, let me get in order. In honor of St. Patrick's Day, which is this coming Sunday, to help us celebrate this event, we're going to have a special performance by Bob Crane, who's been visiting us for the last couple of months, and he is joined by his wife, Connie. They're from Iowa. We're happy to have you here with us, as always. And if you'll direct your attention back to Gordon on the piano and Bob on the microphone, he's going to treat us with an Irish song. Wow. That's quite an introduction, my goodness. Now, she said Bob Crane's going to do a song. Well, he is, but you folks are going to do a song along, right along with it. You know how that goes? And that's going to be Irish Eyes Are Smiling, and you all know the chorus of this song, I'm sure. So when we come to that, when Irish eyes are smiling, that's what we want to hear when I'm multiplied by 50. And then get done with that, we're going to go back and repeat it so that it's permanently a part of your Irish, uh, well, whatever, we don't care. Uh, maestro, let's start, the, I'll start the intro, which is two pages. There's a tear in your eye, and I'm wondering why. 
for it never should be there at all. With such power in your smile, to a stone you beguile, so there's never a teardrop should fall. When your sweet lilting laughter's like some fairy song, and your eyes twinkle bright as can be, you should laugh all the while, and on other times while, and now smile a smile for me. Here you go. When Irish eyes are smiling, sure it is like a morning spring. In the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, all oh, the world sings bright and gay. And when Irish hearts are smiling, should I steal your heart away? Here we go. Oh, wait a minute. You got to repeat it. When Irish eyes are smiling, sure they'll see the heart And when all the stars are smiling, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, all the world seems bright and gay. And when Irish eyes are smiling, sure they'll seal your heart away. Thank you. I should learn to staple my music together. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Gordon. What a treat. And now, carrying on with the holiday tradition, please welcome John Gregory to the podium. Yeah, you better like it. <laughs> uh, this one's called A Grave St. Patrick's Day. Ireland's worth playing disaster at Tuar. It seems it crashed into a graveyard. Rescuers seem to bear digging. They had their share. They've recovered 80, 800 bodies so far. Matthew Brady <coughs> has a neat operation. His use of data needs much translation. The use of statistics he boasts, like the Irish man uses this lamp post for support rather than illumination. <laughs> Danny Boyd started to mumble. He drank plenty and wanted to rumble. He thought that he might get into a fight till man yelled, let's get ready to stumble. <laughs> St. Patrick will last till eternity. So will our rotary fraternity. May you have Irish luck and never get stuck. May your suits all be green, not paternity. <laughs> Have a happy <laughs> Thank you, John. So now between Bob and John, we have no excuse except to be in the spirit of the holiday this coming Sunday. And now we're going to shift gears and bring up Richard Allen to introduce um, our next crap talk. Whoa, those are tough acts to follow. <laughs> so, uh, but it's my, my pleasure today to introduce uh, Philip Crutchfield, who's, um, uh, who had reached out to us in October. Philip's a financial advisor with Raymond James, and um, <clears throat> uh, he, uh, uh, he <clears throat> just give you a little bit of background because he's going to tell you his whole story on how he 
uh, found us in Rotary and, and, and what inspires him in life. But a little bit of the background on him, he was, uh, his undergrad degree, not related to finance directly, I guess, was a Bachelor of Science in Supply Chain and Logistics, uh, from which he wound up teaching uh, in our local schools, the Alachua County Schools, taught economics, government, and history for 12 years. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> and he was also Dean of Students, uh, as well as the Athletic Director at Eastside High School. So uh, quite a career. Before he joined Ray Raymond James, um, he wound up getting his Series 7 and Series 66 financial industry licenses and joined J Raymond James Advisory Mastery Program. Uh, he also has insurance licenses in Florida for health, life, and, uh, life and annuity with variable contracts. And I'll let Philip uh, tell you about his life and the journey that has led him to us today. Thank you, Philip. Best I can do is a green tie compared to what they did. Um, I want to first off thank you guys for having me in the club. It's been a fantastic experience so far, even though I feel like I'm just dipping my toes in, uh, getting things going since uh, joining you in November. Um, they, they told me I have three minutes or I get the hook. So I, I made myself some notes. It's weird when you had to make notes for yourself about your own life. Um, I thought about just printing out copies of my online dating profile and handing them out. Um, so I'm Philip Crutchfield. I'm 37 years old. I've lived in uh, Gainesville uh, since about 2006. I'm not married, no kids. Uh, <laughs> I'm originally from the Panhandle of Florida. You may hear a little extra twang in my voice uh, from time to time, and that's why. I grew up in uh, Jackson County around Mariana um, and graduated from Crestview High School a little further west. Um, my mom was a school teacher, speech and language pathologist for 35 years uh, in elementary schools. And uh, my dad is a row crop farmer, farmed watermelons, uh, peanuts, soybeans, corn. I may be the only uh, financial advisor uh, in town that can torch off a bad bearing in a disc. Um, but uh, it was a good experience growing up. I've got three sisters, one of who is in town here that really encouraged me to join Rotary. She was the uh, president of the Junior League. Her name is Jan Janet Gilbert. Um, growing up, I uh, had a great childhood. I was always playing sports or working. Uh, I, I played uh, multiple sports in high school, uh, focused on golf, even though I'm trying to recover my game. Uh, so I, that's actually how I, I got the coaching bug. That's how I got into teaching. And I started coaching at Eastside. Um, I worked for, uh, in high school, I worked for, uh, basically if I wasn't working for myself, I had to work for my dad for free on the farm. Uh, so I worked at a plant nursery. Uh, I worked at a golf course doing maintenance at one point uh, and, uh, and uh, just odd jobs all over in high school. So I was always do, busy doing something working. I uh, picked up a lot of different experiences. Um, when I first graduated high school, and this is why I've got kind of an odd degree, I started working at the local FedEx terminal because they were just paying great rates. I was going to junior college at the time, and uh, they hired me as a temporary lo uh, loader overnights. Uh, so I'd be in the bottom of the trucks, three in the morning, you know, loading packages for Christmas when their volume really spikes. So they actually put me through school, and so that's why I carry a supply chain and logistics uh, degree. Um, from there, I decided that I would like to have a job in the air conditioning for once in my life. Uh, so I tried to, uh, <laughs> I tried to change uh, paths. My mom encouraged me. She said, you love, you, you love markets, you love economics, you love history. Why don't you try to teach? Uh, you would enjoy that. You could coach. Just things all kind of came together. And so I followed that route and her guidance. Um, I reached, uh, you know, I did that for 12 years here in the school district. My first job, though, was uh, I was the detention instructor at Eastside. Uh, so I can, be, I can be a tough customer if I need to be. Um, but it was a great experience, just, you know, opened my eyes to a lot of the concerns of our community, especially where I come from in the panhandle, just, just a total new experience for me and really changed my views in a lot of ways. Uh, and so I'm so grateful for my time at Eastside and with the school board. Um, I eventually wound up uh, through coaching. I was the department head for uh, the, uh, of the dean, so over student discipline for Eastside and also over athletics, so kind of my, my, Bruce Wayne, Batman, my day job and my night job. So they kept me, kept me pretty busy with doing all the scheduling, doing all the student discipline and uh, going through that experience. I think 
I reached a crossroad that a lot of our educators in town uh, and around the state do where you're kind of at, at a financial crossroad where you have to make a decision. Okay, am I going to stay with this career, uh, keep serving our students, or do, am I really truly meeting the goals that I have personally for myself? And it's, it's, it is a sad situation in our state. Um, but I, I made that decision for myself. I had the opportunity to meet my mentor in the office, David Hansen, and he encouraged me to come join uh, their group and build my own business and uh, kind of use my connections around the town as well as uh, you know my sincerity for serving others, uh, which I think is also what led me to Rotary. Uh, my grandfather was a Rotarian uh, growing up. Uh, he was a postmaster, so he moved around quite a bit. He was a Rotarian in Jackson, Mississippi, and Philadelphia, and in Atlanta, and eventually in San Francisco before he retired back to Florida. So I attended some of like like the grandkids here today. I attended several of the events and lunches and and things like that, uh, and and got to see how that benefited his life. And now I have a little more flexibility in my schedule. I can make my own schedule. So I was like, you know, this would be a good time uh, to look at Rotary, and because it was such a wonderful thing for him, and he was so impactful on me. Um, in my free time, and she's getting closer. That means I'm getting the hook. <laughs> <laughs> she told me that and, and in my free time uh, I like to travel I love good barbecue if you're cooking barbecue please invite me um, I'm attempting to get my golf game back in order I, it was funny it's come full circle I used to avoid working for my dad on the farm now I have I own a collection of three tractors myself I, I, uh, I like to grow some watermelon so I may have some of those for you later this year um, and uh, it's just funny how things come full circle and uh, I just want to thank everybody again for having me. Uh, it's been a it's been a blessing. I've I've gotten to go out and volunteer some of the cleanup days and and things and attend some of the events. And I'm looking forward to growing my role within the club and meeting you and getting to know all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Philip. It's a pleasure to have you in the club. We look forward to working with you on future projects. Now for our first announcement, Brendan Shortling. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, you may see on your tables the announcement for this year's American Values Dinner. As some of you may not know, it does go to the Boy Scouts and now just the Scouts, men and women can join scouting, which is wonderful because it teaches values. And I believe in this thing so much that this year I decided to step up a little bit and help put it together, um, what little I could contribute, and also help pay for the table for Rotary, um, which is Rotary's paying half the table. And we really look forward to hopefully those of you who want to support what you think could be um, building the tomorrow's leaders uh, with us to try to give us a little bit of sponsorship and help attend if you want even. Um, we don't look for a particular value, but whatever you can put in, we'd appreciate. Um, I do it because as an Eagle Scout, I believe in what it taught me and what it made me into and uh, it had a very pivotal uh, effect on my life so um, if you believe in any of that kind of stuff and think that we should so, try to form America's future in some way shape or form this is a way to do it many people in this room already sponsor a lot thank you Mary Kate Walker um, Richard Allen David Gracie Greg Young others that you Doug Wilcox you know I can keep going um, Eric Gaday, who's sponsoring with me, um, that you'll see him on the flyer here. Um, they believe in what we're doing, and many of you also do, that I'm not able to mention because I don't want to get kicked off stage here. But uh, please consider joining us a week from tomorrow, Wednesday night at the Gateway Grand. The information is right there on the flyer, 6 p.m. Come talk to me if you want to find out more. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And now, without further ado, please help me welcome our president, Linda Reinhardt, to the podium. Thank you, everybody, for a fun program so far. Uh, Philip, I just want to call you back up here. I do have a small token for you. Um, we have a plaque, a four-way test plaque in honor of you completing your craft talk. And thank you for jumping in and, and being a great member of our club so far.
Um, I hope everybody was able to make it out to the Wild Game Feast. It was a great time. We had great weather. Um, I do want to say thank you. I'm not even going to attempt to list off all the people that were instrumental in making this happen. But if you uh, organized something, cleaned up something, set up something, poured something, bought a ticket, um, ate food, uh, participated in any way, I really appreciate you uh, doing so. And as soon as we have some final tallies, um, we will certainly share that with you guys. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, it's our today. It's our very own Billy Dodd, who is a board certified hospice and palliative care nurse. She began her career in hospice over 20 years ago as a field nurse. She is a Jacksonville University graduate with high honors and helped develop and implement the first palliative care program in North Central and Northeast Florida. She also developed stimulation based training for residents, physicians and others to help to help have compassionate and difficult conversations. And she has prevent and she has implemented one of the first emergency room palliative programs in the country at UF Jacksonville. She began her master's studies in palliative care administration at the University of Baltimore, Maryland in 2017 and expanded the expanded hospice and palliative care nursing. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my place into North Central Florida in 2018. Billy was one of the original founders of the hospice, hospice, hospice and palliative nursing association in Northeast Florida, and she served as its inaugural president and has also been nominated for one of Florida's top 100 nurses twice. Billy serves the community as a Rotarian on the Coalition of Aging Committee, North Central Florida Senior Advocacy Network, and is the founding chair of the Joint Organization for Exceptional Youth. Billy is driven by her passion to educate and develop quality hospice, hospice and palliative care for all those who need it. She is the mother of three beautiful daughters, one amazing grandson, and she loves to fish with her husband, Battalion, Battalion, Battalion Chief Jeffrey Dodd. So with that, Billy Dodd. So in the honor of St. Patrick's Day, they, they bring you a leprechaun to, to present short person Joe. Thank you all for having me here. And I, I'm not going to read every slide. I'd rather have a conversation. Um, a lot of this brings up things we don't like to talk about. So usually when I go to talk to someone, I'm like, today we're going to talk about sex. And they're like, and I'm like, not really. We're just going to talk about hospice. And they're like, oh, thank God. <clears throat> so I love, it's a privilege to do the work that we do. It is a calling and a privilege. And I'm, I'm so blessed to have the people around me what we build in life is not what we build, but who we build behind us. And so our legacy is who we build. Hospice is a sacred um, thing for all of us. And protecting the integrity of what real hospice care is my life, life's mission. So a little bit about us, community hospice and palliative care. We were started in 1979. Um, we're an innovative leader. We were started by a pastor and a parishioner who didn't want to die in the hospital. And so before there was a hospice benefit, this doctor and some of the uh, parishioners in the church carried a pager and one was a nurse and they took care of this person. And we grew out of that. We were born, yes, in Jacksonville, nonprofit. Our CEO, Susan Ponder Stansel, carried a pager. She was a volunteer social worker back in the, in the beginning and she's still with the organization. Um, she's over Alivia Care, which is, we had a parent company instead of, but still board-driven by community-based board, nonprofit, mission-based. So during the 44-year history, we've taken care of over 220,000 adults and children. We take care of about 200 um, chronically or terminally ill children every day. And we are currently in 16 counties, but we're also partnered with other hospices up in Georgia, some of the nonprofits trying to come together to protect the integrity of, of good hospice care. Um, we have about 950 employees and about 1,000 volunteers. There's volunteer information on your table. It is rewarding 
work to do. Um, and so we're just happy to be here. When they, when they came to me and said, Billy, um, we need you to go out to Gainesville and expand because in this area there was an unmet need of patients who needed hospice care that weren't receiving it. And we applied for their certificate of need and based on our merit, we were awarded to come out here in the first nonprofit in the state to be awarded based on our laurels and our star quality. We are a second year, your only hospice honors in this area based on quality. So people think hospice is a place. They're going to take me to that place. Hospice is a philosophy. So 90% of my patients are at home, whether it's under a bridge or in a mansion. They live in ALFs and nursing facilities. Most people are at home, wherever they call home. A hospice place is only needed by about 2% of patients. And so then that would be a hospice house. So hospice is not a place, it's a philosophy, and that's something to, to remember. And I'm grateful for that because I want to be on my back porch with my grandbaby and my loved ones surrounding me. I'm coming from back here because I'm short and I can't see. Um, so it's about comfort and dignity. I don't take care of the dying. I take care of the living until their maker calls them home. And I help them to live. I help them to get to Disney World. I help get them on a stretcher to that son's graduation. I help them to walk down the aisle with an IV pole if that's what it takes. I help them to live the best life possible. It's not about dying. Most people think hospice is two days. Oh, they're in hospice. They're going to be gone by the end of the week. And that happens, but that's because people access it too late. I had patients live up to a year or two, and I know that they did because of the amount of support that they had. And some people graduate out of hospice. We have to boot them out because they start doing so well, and that's a great thing. So I talked about where care is provided, any place that you call home. And again, last few days of life, that's not the case. Anyone... Your, Ronald Reagan signed the hospice benefit into law, and so when two physicians agree that if your disease progresses as it normally sh should, given the diagnosis, that they wouldn't be surprised if you died within the next six months, then you qualify. And so it's important that you don't wait. I can't fix everything in two days with a patient, but if I have six months to a year, I can teach the wife to pump gas. I can get the son on the phone in prison to say I'm sorry or goodbye. I can help make things happen like that last fishing trip or that last sea do ride. But I need time for that. I can get the kid home from the military, but I need time for that. And so accessing hospice sooner is always better. I know I'm skipping a lot. This is what comes with hospice a nurse, social worker, chaplain, um, a volunteer, a physical therapist, home health aide, a physician, nurse practitioner, and we don't take care of just the patient. We take care of that whole family, and we take care of that family after you're gone. <clears throat> when we change how someone dies, excuse me, we change the lives of those left behind, how they grieve. Did they have the conversations? Did they make the memories? Did they take the hand photos? Ironically, my mother died without hospice suddenly, and I just remember standing in the emergency room saying, are you kidding me? Like I was shocked. I had it all planned out. It was going to be beautiful when the day came. And so it so inspires me for you to have conversations with your loved ones about what your wishes are and what you want and where you want to be. We don't talk about it, so then we're surprised when we end up in the ICU. I don't want my kids to be in the waiting room. They know, get me to my back porch. Your family needs to know. Anyone over, over the age of 18 should have this conversation with their family. It's not giving up hope. Well, they went to hospice, so they're done for. Or even sometimes physicians say, I don't want to tell them about hospice. I don't want them to think I'm giving up on them. Doing hospice is doing everything. It's doing everything you can, acknowledging that medicine, a 
curative medicine is no longer beneficial. Sometimes it can even be burdensome. We need to know that it's not giving up hope. I can hope for a good life, whatever that is left. It's about living with dignity and care and support. People think it's cancer. Any disease process that's going to progress to a, a prognosis of six months or less, anyone is available, anyone is eligible for hospice at that point. Too many people think it's just for cancer or it's expensive. Here's a, a sh something that's bothered me my whole career. So I went into hospice. I thought I was going to take care of grandma and grandpa, right? Older people at the end of life. No. Most of my patients were 60 and below. Um, and, and I started to recognize they're all white. I'm like, maybe it's the region I'm in. But no, nationally, only 2% of hospice patients are of color. It's astounding. So we've recognized that. And through my experience with Leadership Gainesville, we've placed special people to engage communities to educate that every single person, regardless of, of income or color or religious background, should have access or knowledge of what is available to them. And so I'm very proud that the organization has seen that mission to, to move forward. So it's not just cancer. And this is a list of some diseases, but not all. As they progress, um, hospices serve only those who can't afford it. As a nonprofit and based on our foundation, we are able to never turn away a patient based on their ability to pay. And I think that that is so important. As human beings, every person deserves comfort. Um, they deserve caring at the end of life. And it's so good to walk into a room and know that I'm not going to have to say no. My staff is not going to have to say no. And that's such a blessing. And so this is how hospice is paid for. Um, again, Ronald Reagan signed into law, so Medicare, Medicaid, some or private insurance, and then our foundation, and regardless of ability to pay, we take care of you. Nothing else can be done. You know, I know you've already heard probably in your life the term, do not resuscitate. I hate that term. Or we're going to withdraw care. That's what they say in the ICU. And so I will, with my 411 self, will walk up to a doctor and say, we are not withdrawing care. We never withdraw care. We stop aggressive measures that are no longer beneficial to the patient and provide comfort, but we don't withdraw care. And in some states, it's not called do not resuscitate. It's called allow natural death. It means the same thing, but it sounds a whole lot better. I'm not going to do something to you that's not going to be beneficial. And then we expect families with no medical background to have to make decisions about whether to do CPR on someone or not. One time I heard a doctor tell a family, and it's one time in my whole career, I'm not offering CPR for your loved one because it will not save them and it will do harm. And I just wanted to stand up and clap. Like, how brave of him to tell the truth. We have to be better about talking about death and dying and about living well as long as we can. Hospice is doing something. It's doing everything you can to love your person and make sure that they have dignity and care for whatever time they have left. And it's not just for the patient. It's for that grandbaby for bereavement. It's for those kids that are fighting in the hallway. It's for the daughter who just don't tell mama how sick she is. And then I go to the patient and she says, don't tell my daughter how sick I am. And I'm like, all right, you two, we're going to have a conversation. And they both cried and hugged. But it's like, it was like the elephant in the room. The, the patient wouldn't ask the daughter for pain medicine because she didn't want her to know that she was hurting. 
And I'm like, this has to stop. So then they were able, I was able to put her on a pain pump. She didn't ask, have to ask for medication. She was at home, and they were both better for it. More so than ever, when hospice was founded in the 70s, almost all were nonprofit. Today we live in a changing medical world um, where now only about 19% of hospices are nonprofit. What's the difference? The difference is if you go to CMS, gov hospice compare and look at the quality scores and look at as people get sicker or closer to death our visits increase there are other agencies around the country look at the quality indicators be an informed consumer um, there's a more of a for-profit movement we are really trying to protect the integrity of what nonprofit hospices are. So we do a lot of unfunded things. Bad business decision, probably. But it's what real hospice is, whether it's pet therapy or real bereavement, um, where we have sessions and community bereavement. If there's trauma in the community, we're at the food giveaways. We went to people's homes with paramedics during early COVID to vaccinate those that are shut in. We do community outreach. Our pediatric division, the non-hospice part is not funded. So all of these are things that we reinvest any of our profit back into the communities that we serve. Our veterans care, our nurses are trained. Veterans have different needs at end of life. And so we make sure that we are trained to take good care of our veterans. Am I good on time? I didn't want to get in trouble. So be an informed consumer. Um, check out hospice, cms.gov hospice compare. And um, make sure that you're working with an organization. It's not all about community hospice and palliative care. I would rather you have hospice care as long as it's good hospice care. It's hard enough for us to talk about the H word, right? And so if you have a bad actor come in and a bad experience, then for your whole family, for the rest of your life, you're not likely going to access that care. So you want to make sure that you're working with an organization with integrity that's mission-based, that has a community board, and we're solely focused on serving the needs of our communities far outside of hospice. We do education that isn't funded um, and outreach. And again, we rely on gifts for some of those um, non-covered, unfunded care when we have patients that aren't funded. So we talked about some of these statistics. This is older than what I read you um, as we started, but our money stays in our community. We hire from within the community. Our people live in the communities that they serve. You know, I had, a, <laughs> I had the privilege of being a field nurse and living in the community that I took care of. And so, it, you know, I'd be in Winn-Dixie and run into people later. And just a short story, I had a patient. He was a professor, and I loved his wife. She was like the best caregiver. She had a chart. She had everything laid out. And I got this time, and he pooped, and he—I I mean, she just knew. And I said, "Okay, when I leave, before I leave, I'm going to give you homework." And she was so excited. Got her pad and her pen. Okay. And I took it out of her hand and I set it down. And I said, "When I leave, I want—they've been married forever. I want you to go crawl up in that bed with him and lay beside him like you have for 40 years." And she looked at me. Like, and I was, I was like, oh, God, I overstepped. Months went by. We never talked about it again. Eventually, he passed. About a year later, in Winn-Dixie, because we don't have, we didn't have Publix where I live. She comes up to me, and she's like, oh, hey, Billy. 
it's so good to see you because you feel like you're part of their family. And she's like, I just wanted tears in her eyes. She said, I just want to thank you because I would never would have thought to do what you told me to do. And like, wow. That, that's what real hospice care is. It's looking beyond just the nursing needs, but the needs of that family. And so being able to teach staff what matters. And if there's a, if you want to take a note, um, read the Ira Bioc book, The Four Things That Matter Most. It's really short. Thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. And I forgive you. And if you can make those things happen in the end of life for both sides, it's a beautiful thing. Another patient I had, he was younger. Hey, man, how you doing? Our default answer in the South is, I'm fine. And I'm, I'd be like, now tell me how you really are. And I'd close the door. And he's like, I'm pissed. Sorry. There's a youngin in here. I'm like, well, what's going on? He's like, well, they're all upset because I'm dying. And I'm like, okay. Tell me more. You can always go three questions in. He said, well, they don't even realize that I'm losing all of them. I'll, wow. He was grieving the loss of everyone. They were just grieving the loss of one person. So helping them understand that and make memories was phenomenal. That's good stuff. So this is what, um, what kind of care is provided. Bereavement, you get a whole team of people. We bring the medication. There's no running to the pharmacy. We bring the DME. We take care of everything. We're responsible for you. Um, and we address the needs that are specific to you. We sit at a table where um, with physician, nurse practitioner, all these different disciplines, but we all have an even say in what needs to happen for you and your family. And it's beautiful. I think all medicine should be like that. If you have information, here's a phone number. I'm always available. I get Facebook messages, text messages from neighbors, friends, family. I, I need help. So I'm always available. So I wanted to leave us some time for some questions. Hey, Billy. Uh-oh. Enjoyed you. I enjoyed your story about getting the wife to cuddle up with her husband. I'm wondering if you can get ex-wives to cuddle up with their <laughs> husband. I always love a challenge, Ben. Nothing's impossible for a hospice nurse. Hey, hey Ben. Hey, Ben. Ben, which which one do you want? <laughs> just, just so you know, Ben told me one time, he said, He'd been married three times, and they all made the same mistake. <laughs> they all married him. They, got, they thought they got somebody else. Billy, my question is about a will. Do you guys talk about that? Because I can't tell you how many friends I've had that have uh, not had one, and the family has to really suffer because of that. Okay. This is a whole other lecture, but I'm going to go meat and potatoes. A will is about your money and your property. A living will is about your health care decisions before you die. You need to have both. I'm selfish. I have one because I don't trust my kids to not be fighting in the hallway. A power of attorney doesn't always include health care decision making, so you need to check that piece. But you need to, for after death, we, we think we die, our kids are going to be kumbaya and the family's going to stay together. The best thing you can do to make that happen is get a will, maybe get a trust. Sorry, I'm a moving challenge. Make sure you have a health surrogate and a living will or that your power of attorney is a DPOA and has that language in there, read it. So do a will, 
maybe a trust, but beforehand, healthcare surrogate, living will, or DPOA with that included. Did that help? Okay. Uh, Billy, a uh, question from Zoom real quick here. Uh, Carlos wants to know, what is the difference between hospice and palliative care? Great question. All hospice is palliative care. It's end of life palliative care. But palliative, think of a big circle. This is palliative care. And there's a little circle inside that circle that's hospice. This is end of life. So anyone with a chronic burdensome illness that's debilitating with symptoms, whether it's um, heart failure, whether it's COPD, anything like that, on diagnosis ALS, you can start palliative care early. And it should follow you throughout all your curative therapy, uh, surgeries, doctor's appointments, it doesn't limit any aggressive therapies. On the hospice side, medical intervention is no longer beneficial or desired, and it's more of a comfort focus, and that's hospice. Did that answer the question? I think so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Billy, thank you so much for the great presentation. In honor of you being here today. Oh, standing, standing ovation today. Looky there. Uh, Billy, in honor of you speaking today, we're going to make a donation in, the name, in your name to the Bread of the Mighty. Okay, uh, again, great, great presentation today. Uh, next week, we're going to have our Rotary Youth Exchange students um, coming and speaking. So I hope you'll join us for that to get to know our two students a little bit. Um, our quote of the day. Let's see. Endings matter, not just for the person, but perhaps even more for the ones left behind. That's Atul Gawande. And our winning Rotary Safari reading, uh, Rotary reading Safari ticket today is 991. 991. If you have that number, come see me. With that, meeting adjourned. <laughs>